The Museum of Seminole County History is full of old maps that show what Central Florida looked like years ago and the changes that have taken place over time. This is the story of one of those maps called the Orange County 1890 map and how it was nearly destroyed only to be restored with the help of a federal grant. The story begins before Seminole County even existed with the arrival of a Swedish immigrant in Sanford named J. Otto Fries. Mike Garcia, a Seminole County project manager in the Public Works Department, researched Fries' background and found that Fries, born in Sweden in 1838, was a trained civil engineer. J. O. Fries was a, uh, was a Swedish immigrant who arrived here in Central Florida in I think Christmas Eve of 1871, he'd come across the Atlantic and then down the east coast of Florida and was one of the early pioneers settling in Sanford. I guess he had been drawn here with some other Swedes uh, following Henry Sanford and his planting of uh, citrus groves in, in, in uh, Mellonville at the time, what's now known as, as Sanford. Um, from there he got uh, involved with a, a gentleman out in the Geneva area who was a Russian exile who understood that his background in civil engineering might be helpful and learning how to, be, how to do surveys in the community. People were settling the area, they wanted to know where their boundaries were. So, uh, so J.O. Fries went up to Gainesville to get some additional training and, and education at, at what is now the University of Florida up there. Came back to, to the, the uh, Oviedo area and settled there and began his career surveying here, helping out the early settlers uh, establishing their boundaries. Once he settled in, in, in uh, the Oviedo area, J.O. Fries uh, worked as a deputy surveyor for the government uh, doing surveys of the land that the federal government was getting rid of, section, township, and range kind of thing. Uh, most of the surveys had been done and there were some areas that had been omitted, some areas that needed to be resurveyed, and J.O. Um, actually did some resurveys here in Central Florida. One in particular was out in the, the Chiliota area. Um, he resurveyed that, I think, in uh, about 1882 or so. Um, from there, he uh, finally got elected to be the county surveyor for Orange County. So when he becomes Orange County surveyor in 1883, he takes office and he creates, the, he, around 1890, he publishes this map of Orange County. Um, he needed an, uh, one big map to represent the, the area that included Seminole and Orange at the time. Uh, so he created this map that, that we're talking about today. Um, one of the unusual things about it is it does have a lot of family houses with their family names shown there on the map. Um, highly unusual. Sometimes you would see it, but it's not very common to have that kind of detailed information on the map of, of who lived where. This map in particular has, has both of those elements in it. It shows the original government survey land lines, the section, township, and range um, lines on it, the ones that he would set those markers for, as well as it has the topographical information. Now, the cadastral information is the land boundaries and uh, the topographical information is basically the lay of the land, where are the hilly spots, where is the swampy land, uh, which was really informative on one big piece of paper so that you could have an inventory of the land. J. O. Fries was well respected in, in central Florida. Most of the settlers settling in this area needed to know where good land versus bad land was, and so they sought out J. O. Fries in advance before taking the steamship down here um, to get his advice uh, of where they should look for land, whether it be citrus groves or whether it needed to be uh, farming land or, or whatnot. Um, so M Mr. Fries was well respected by the, by the community. The Orange County 1890 map is framed under glass and measures about 57 by 43 inches. It's a combination topographical and cadastral map. The map has been in the museum's collection since March 1989, when it was donated by Arthur Beckwith, who has received it from a Seminole County resident named Jack Fox in 1954. It formerly was on display at the old Seminole County Courthouse in downtown Sanford. The museum's coordinator, Kim Nelson, had noticed that both the map and frame were damaged. She decided to call in a specialist to check out the map. I'm going to brush under the fibers and keep the fibers there actually because they're needed to hold the paper in place. Conservator Alexandra Van Hawk evaluated the map in August 2009 and found it was about six months away from total disintegration. Nelson applied for a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the funds to restore the map were awarded in March 2010. 
It's so important to Seminole County because even though it's titled Orange County, 1890, and as we all know, Seminole County didn't become in existence until 1913, we are all part of the same area and the same county uh, jurisdiction and this reflects the history yeah, the and line, the yeah. topography, right in other words, the lay of the land, of what Orange and Seminole counties were like yeah. in 1890. Alexandra von Hock has extensive experience restoring works on paper for such clients as the Cornell Art Museum and is a certified professional associate of the Smithsonian Institute. She got to work on the map immediately. My training is very extensive. I was very lucky to be able to get an apprenticeship with one of the leading New York conservators that was Russian trained. So my training is um, Russian with a lot of Russian techniques, which is very unusual, um, a lot of sturgeon glues. And then he also sent me all over the world to study with masters in other areas that he was not proficient in. So all my paper conservation is all based on Japanese methods that are centuries old, that we know are very, very safe, and that are absolutely toxic free. So there are no chemicals that are ever used in all the paper conservation. There's no bleaching ever used. Everything is gentle and beautiful and healthy for the paper and the conservator, of course. And um, everything is using Japanese handmade papers or handmade rice paste. So um, you've, your finished product is very, very healthy and a product that will last. What we're going to discuss now is basically the treatment plan for the map itself. And what I have in front of me is the back of the frame, the glass that was in the frame when it was removed and brought to my lab, and half of the map. This map was uh, printed in two pieces, so it's been uh, removed along its seam line, and they're going to be treat treated as two separate pieces and then reattached. This is very interesting. This is the reason why this poor map, uh, the paper is degraded so terribly. We have to address its package, which is the oak frame. Oak is extremely acidic. And what happens is if any moisture is involved in this, it migrates extreme amounts of acidity into your paper. This also initially had an oak backing board across the entire back of it, which also lended huge amounts of acidity into the paper. And for a long period of time, I'd say at least 60 years, 70 years, this uh, piece of art was sitting on a floor that was wet. And that's why at the very bottom, there's huge discolorations called tide lines in the dark brown. And if you see very closely, you'll see the stains have actually migrated up from the wood of the bottom of the frame into the art. Von Hawk carefully separated the map into two sections. It had originally been printed in two pieces in 1890, since larger printing presses were not available at that time. The other thing that's very noticeable right now is these brush strokes that you see are actually the paste that was laid onto the paper and then there's a thin, thin gauze linen backing that was placed onto the paper itself, which is still here intact. But it's so degraded and so thin and fine that you cannot see this without very close inspection. We're going to be addressing some damage that was done by the previous attempts of restoration. And if you can see from this point forward, you can see that it's a great deal lighter. And that's because there are large pieces of this particular tape laid down on top of this to try to save this from collapsing. And you can see uh, all of the breaking tears. Here's a piece that's completely loose. Uh, it, it goes all along to these edges. And I removed this. This is a, a linen base that was laid on with a two-part epoxy. And you can see how very, very strong it was. Um, and it's totally, of course, inappropriate at this point to place on this, but kind hands um, 
really wanted to save this and uh, so it's all understandable it happens all the time uh, the other thing is you can start seeing a little bit of the backing linen is coming up just a touch so that you can get an idea how thin it is it's thinner than a scarf uh, very very thin these actually are going to be laid back down and uh, used in the restoration to actually hold the paper together because it's extremely fragile. It's like one ply of toilet paper um, and it's basically dust at this point. So after all of that was removed, all of these little uh, individual pieces will be placed uh, in, um, in glass covers and retained and washed along with this large piece in cleaning and then replaced back in this area. So uh, with all the damage and all the acidity that was done from the back, you can understand what happens to paper when it is an extremely acidic backing and it has an environment that's very, in, uh, very acidic. You can see the extreme discoloration of the piece itself. This actually should be uh, almost eggshell white. So this browning is called slow burn and what you're actually looking at are the paper fibers that are slowly burning because they've been so acidic. It's almost like a rusting of uh, the paper fibers within the map itself. Now here we have the beginning of the treatment sequence being put into fruition. The first thing that's going to happen with the map is that it's going through a total submersion wash where the art is actually laid under water and slowly washed where the toxins are rinsed from the papers themselves. Of course, first the papers are tested so that all the inks are, we know are going to be safe when I do a submersion wash because I know it's going to be an extended period of time underneath water. After the paper is being totally cleaned and relaxed, I know I'm going to have to line it because it is so extremely fragile. And this is just part of the uh, amount of Japanese papers that I have to choose from that will actually be hand dyed by myself to match the work itself so that first it'll strengthen the entire back. Papers are also have to be a little bit lighter than the paper itself and we're doing inlays, insets for areas that are lost completely, as in the bad areas where the bugs have chewed through and there's no more map anymore. These are all handmade papers. They are absolutely different in every way, shape, and form. They're also extremely expensive. You're probably looking at maybe $15,000 worth of paper. And I go through every single one, has its own color, every one has its own thickness. These have already been dyed by myself to match the map to pieces that are so thin that you can virtually see through their gossamer papers, they're called. They've all been handmade by masters um, in Japan. Sometimes I have to wait four or five years to get a particular paper. And these, of course, are even more layers of paper now, I've already chosen the appropriate papers for the backing and the overlays on the papers themselves, and that's what I'll be showing to you next. Well, the papers have been chosen for the map uh, restoration. The uh, half of the map that I've been working on has all been washed, it's all been dried, and it's ready for the application of the backing to strengthen it. This is the paper. They've all been allotted numbers, this is an HM55. Because the papers are all individually fingerprinted because each paper is handmade, they have to be used in the same lots. So the same day, the same temperature, the same person who produced them, it's considered one lot. And if I don't use the same lot of these papers, they will react differently. And each one of these sections of map are going to be taking three of these sheets. 
So I have to be sure each sheet is exactly the same so that it'll apply the same. The stress on the map will be the same then I, because I don't want it to pucker or warp or move on me. Right now we're on the detail table. This is the map, it's been fully washed and it's been fully lined with the Japanese papers that we just discussed earlier. And you can see the difference in the paper. Now you can note that there still are some staining in here because we don't want this paper to look brand new. It's got age to it. And we must learn to appreciate the patina of time. And there's elegance and there's wear to this paper. It's gone through a lot. It's, and it's part of its history. We don't want to wipe that away. Also, chemicals are never used. So there is no bleaching involved in any of my papers. Now you can see all the watercolors are very, very vibrant. You can actually see the red line or the demarcation of the county lines that are extremely important. You can read the map a lot easier. And this is the Japanese paper. What I do at this point is I replace all the tiny pieces of paper that were falling off the map that were stuck to the inappropriate backing of the map, things that were just loose and just blown around inside of it. They were all um, retained, they were all treated the same, and they're all over here in this area. Just to show you how small these are, they're laying between two layers of random spun nylon because they would blow in a million directions. And there's actually one, they, they tend to attach themselves to the uh, random spun, but as long as I've got them, it's okay. And you can see how tiny some of these pieces are. And I'll be using forcep tweezers to pick up the tiniest of them and they'll all be placed back on the map itself. At this stage, the map is close to completion. Already the difference is dramatic. Areas that were hidden before can now be seen like the red county line shown here. Alexandra carefully loads the map onto a carrier to move it to its final work area where the frame and glazing will be added. Thanks to a donation from the Seminole County Historical Society, the map will be housed in its original frame, but will be specially prepared for years of preservation. Now the piece is washed and lined. I'll be putting in all the missing substrate pieces that are loose. And from this side, the next half of the map will be attached. When the two map sides are both lined and reattached, and the frame has been totally conserved, which is, uh, it'll be sterilized and cleaned. It'll be mounted to the back of a micro-chambered system board, which is a trapment for any off-gassing, which is another layer of protection for the piece. And then the entire package will be placed back into the frame. There'll be new hanging attachments, there'll be new glazing, and then the piece will be sent back to the museum, ready to be hung on the wall for everyone to enjoy. J.O. Freeze would be proud to know that his map has received a new lease on life. Yet a footnote to history makes this project even more valuable. It turns out that a fire in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. destroyed all of the census records for the year 1890. Freeze's map is the only remaining record of the families that lived in the Orange and Seminole County area in 1890. We're here, it's good to see y'all, uh, to help us rededicate the map, the 1890s map that Otto Freeze made of Orange County. In those days, Orange County and Seminole County were together. And uh, this is only one of three that we know uh, in existence. Uh, this map has tremendous historical value because of what the details that he put in the map of who was living where and uh, well it's just one of those great things it, it's 
Less than a year later, the Seminole County Historical Society unveiled the newly restored map and rededicated it to the public. It again rests in its rightful place on the wall in the Museum of Seminole County History, one of only three copies in existence. Thanks to the quick action and resourceful planning of a team of professionals and concerned preservationists, the Orange County map of 1890 will remain a piece of the living history of Seminole County for future generations to learn from and enjoy.